Welcome to the Sustainable Dish Podcast. I'm Diana Rogers, a real food registered dietitian, author, and sustainability advocate. I co-host this podcast with James Connolly, who was a producer on my film, Sacred Cow. I also founded the Global Food Justice Alliance, an initiative advocating for the inclusion of animal source foods like meat, dairy, and eggs for a more nutritious, sustainable, and equitable worldwide food system. You can check it out and join me at globalfoodjustice.org. Thanks again for listening, and now on to our show. Hey, everyone. I'm really excited to let you know about the free Community Blood Sugar Challenge that I'm running for the month of February for my followers. You'll learn how to use a continuous glucose monitor, CGM, to find out how food impacts your individual body so that you can make the best choices when it comes to your diet. It was a complete game changer for me and I recommend CGMs to all of my nutrition clients. I'm partnering with Levels to offer two free months when you sign up as a member to get the CGM without a prescription. Just need to visit sustainabledish.com backslash blood sugar, all one word, and enter your email to get the free ebook, access to the live Zoom calls, and the special offer from Levels. And if you're listening to this after our challenge has ended, you can still get access to my Blood Sugar Challenge ebook and the recorded Zoom calls, plus the special offer from Levels. Learning about how food impacts your blood sugar is valuable information that I think we all should know. Visit sustainabledish.com backslash blood sugar to sign up. Uh, cool. So this is um, James Connolly uh, for a Sustainable Dishes podcast. Um, uh, Matt's actually kind of been following me for a little bit. We've sort of touched base a couple times. Um, you know, we we sort of live in two different worlds. I'm I'm in New York City, uh, and Matt is uh, outside of uh, Bozeman, Montana. Um, but I kind of wanted to kind of bring him on. Uh, his name is Matt uh, Skoglin. Uh, him and his wife, Sarah, um, are first generation uh, uh, bison ranchers. Um, and we'll kind of go into some of the origin story because I actually find it enormously fascinating. Um, I, I do think that there is a generation of kids who don't want to spend their lives going from cubicle to cubicle. As, as one of my best friends says, it, you know, they put you into crib and then they put you into a schoolroom. And then they put you into a cubicle and they put you into a casket. And so you spend your life in a box. Um, and so that, so I'm having this conversation in my head with Matt, because I've listened to you interviewed a bunch of times on a number of different podcasts. And I, I, I get the sense that you've always had that in the back of your mind. Like, I can't live a life going from box to box. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can kind of like introduce yourself with uh, the name of your ranch and then kind of talk about your origin story, because I do find it endlessly fascinating. Sure. Um, well, well, first, you know, thank you so much for having me on. I'm a big fan of what you do and um, th thrilled to be here. Um, so, yeah, so my name is Matt Skoglund and um, my wife, Sarah, and I, we have two kids, Otto and Greta, and uh, they're five and nine. And we started North Bridger Bison, our bison ranch. Um, we started it from scratch in 2018. And it's located, we're up here in the Shield Valley, which is about 30 miles northeast of Bozeman, Montana. Um, uh, really beautiful area. Uh, really, um, you know, still very much a, um, a ranching agricultural valley. Um, got the Bridger Mountains on one side and the Crazy Mountains on the other. Um, but yeah, it was a, a long, winding, very nonlinear uh, path in, in getting here. Um, so, so I was born and raised in suburban Chicago, uh, zero background in farming or agriculture, ranching whatsoever. Um, and you know, without getting too deep into the weeds, you know, I, I, uh, I, 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 I fell in love with fly fishing in high school. And that was kind of my entrance um, into conservation and, you know, becoming a passionate environmentalist. Um, went to college in the Northeast um, and, and was introduced to hunting in college by this amazing guy 
in Montgomery in Vermont. And um, uh, that just totally, you know, that was a huge, huge, had a huge impact on me and how I looked at the world and food um, and absolutely loved living in Vermont and, and you know, a more rural lifestyle. Um, and so, and then this huge passion for conservation and environmental work um, or, or this interest in environmental work. And so I ended up, I went to law school and graduated from law school in 2005, clerked for a federal magistrate judge in Chicago, joined a large law firm in Chicago, spent a couple of years there. I knew it wasn't for me long-term, but it was a good place to start. And um, so Sarah and I, I had fallen in love with the West in Montana, you know, the West in high school, Montana in college, and, yeah. um, and then just a variety of things. In, in both my life and Sarah's life made it clear that, you know, life is short and, um, you know, the, the cubicle, you know, story is, yeah, I connect with, I connect with that big time. I just did not want to, you know, um, that, that's not the life I wanted to live. And so we moved to Bozeman um, in the fall of 08, a month after we got married. And I ultimately got a job with the Natural Resources Defense Council, the NRDC, doing non-litigation non policy work for, for, and I spent 10 years there, um, ultimately becoming the director of the Northern Rockies office. And uh, I worked on various issues from, you know, multiple wildlife issues, also worked on the campaign to uh, that working against the proposed pebble mine in Alaska. Um, and, but the big issue I worked on was, was bison and, um, and, and, and over that time, we had two kids. And as much as I liked NRDC and respect the work that they do, I was really craving to do something tangible, land-based, conservation-based on my own. And um, I, I guess the example I, I give with environmental policy work is, you, you know, I'd have like a coffee meeting with a state agency official and a federal agency official and say, you know, you guys really need to do X. And they'd say, Matt, we couldn't agree more with you, but politically that's a non-starter. And then you, you go back to your office and you're like, what are, what are we doing here? Like, I have, no, I have no control over this process. So much of it is, it's political in nature. Um, and so you, it's just, it's, you know, it's important work, but it, it becomes a slog and becomes frustrating. And so, um, uh, I, you know, the idea of doing something on a much smaller scale, but something that's tangible that you can see, touch, feel, um, that just like really appealed to me. Um, and I literally read an article in the Bozeman Daily Chronicle about the National Bison Association having their 2017 conference in Big Sky and that mm -hmm. the bison industry was growing and they were looking for producers. And I read it and I'm, not kidding at all. Like I read it, I was like, wow, like that'd be so cool for mm -hmm. someone to do that. But I'm from suburban Chicago. C clearly that's not me. And I went on with my day. And then months later, it just like was still kicking around my brain. And then I read this book, Buffalo for the Broken Heart by Dan O'Brien. And he started Wild Idea Buffalo in South Dakota. He's a hero of mine. And he pioneered with the, the modern, uh, what they call field harvesting bison. So Instead of yep. trucking them to a slaughterhouse, which is super high stress for bison, you just drive out in the pasture wherever they are that day and kill a bison with a headshot with a rifle. It's as ethical and humane as it gets, it leads to incredible meat quality. And so that was like an instant light bulb moment. And that's where we said, all right, let's, let, let's take a closer look at this. And, and we got serious about it. And I met with a holistic management consultant and went to his, uh, he had a four day workshop on a bison ranch and um, just kept, you know, just getting more and more excited as we dug deeper into the details and put a business plan together. Um, and yeah, and then we, we ultimately found this piece of ground out here and um, started from scratch in 2018. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, um, I, it's like some part of me says, uh, I you could you could easily convince a, you know somebody like me to go and and do what you did. I think it sounds absolutely wonderful. How on how on earth did you get your wife on board? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, she you know Sarah's amazing, and yeah. um, 
she, um, she, yeah, she was totally on board. We, you know, it, it was interesting. When we, when we got really serious about it, um, you know, we'd lived in Montana for almost 10 years and, and, in, and we lived right in the heart of Bozeman and we had two kids and this amazing, you know, community of friends. And so, um, and, 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 and Sarah, you know, I think we're, we're both like, I guess you know, dreamers, like we, 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 we like to dream and think big and we, you know, talk about that stuff and support one another. Um, and she loved it. I mean, she, 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 she was excited about it. However, she was very clear. She said, look, I'm all in, but it's gotta be within an hour of Bozeman. Like I right. am not, not, we're not moving seven hours away and starting over like our communities here. Um, and so, so that was her, that was her only, you know, those are the only sideboards that she put on it. Um, and we both, I mean, um, I guess, I mean, it kind of goes without saying, I hope that like, when we got serious about it, we just, we went back and forth playing devil's advocate with one another. Like I always right. tell people like, you know, the, um, like, like the appeal of this is so obvious, right? It's just, you know, right. Google ranching in Montana and you see mountains and animals and grass and beautiful sunsets and sunrises. Like that's the easy part, but we were really like, okay, What's what 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 do the hard days look like, and and what are the trade offs, and what are we giving up? And we knew it'd be a massive massive lifestyle change, and so we really tried to like just put ourselves in every scenario imaginable, not to talk ourselves out of it, but just to make sure that you know kind of that 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 like um, that gut check, like are you know mm -hmm. are we are we really going to do this? Are we prepared for this? Because um, this is a huge change, and we ultimately decided. Yes, we, you know, we, 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 we always say, I mean, this is the absolute truth that we put so much into this in 20, late 2017, early 2018, and got so excited about it, that at some point, the, like, the risk of not doing it became greater mm -hmm. than the risk of doing it. We were like, we might crash and burn, or we might decide this was a horrible decision, but we have to try. Like, at this yeah. point, we, so, so that's where we got to. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think, um, I mean, I kind of want to dive in a little bit into how you got into uh, holistic management, uh, wide bison, um, and, you know, uh, just some of the aspects of, um, because it, you kind of set yourself up into a niche that may work well on paper, um, you know, just in terms of on-site slaughter, and any number of different issues that are not part of the sort of na narrative uh, for for cattle ranching or just ranching in general, any anything dealing with ruminant animals in in the United States nowadays. So I wonder if you can dive a little bit into some of the uh, thought processes and and the things that you weren't willing to compromise on. Sure, um, you know so. Um... As I said, you know, I worked for years on bison issues at NRDC, so I had totally fallen in love with the species, knew a lot about it, tracked, you know, news articles, and just just bison were uh, played a prominent role in my world for many many years, and 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 that article in the Chronicle about bison ranching is what put it on my radar. So um, so bison just it just made sense to me. Um, but I should say, like, I, you know, it's funny because um, I think some people think, you know, because you raise bison, you must not like cattle when like nothing could be further from truth. I, I love cattle. And um, I think it's just totally, you know, it's the saying, it's not the cow, it's the how. It's, it's totally depends on, um, you know, what, you know, there are definitely trade offs between the two species. And, uh, um, and it's just like anything, it comes down to, uh, what you're interested in personally. And so for me with bison, um, like I said, I love the animal. And then, you know, the fact that they um, are, are, you know, very hardy, you know, they've been on this landscape for thousands of years. So like when it's 40 below, they don't care. Um, they breed on their own, they calve on their own, defend themselves against carnivores very well. Um, and then, you know, uh, they also have a, you know, from, from a business standpoint, which this is a business, you know, we're, 
um, we're not a nature reserve or you know a nonprofit. Like we're we're a, a working ranch with a with a with a meat business. Um, you know, bison um, because there's so such a it's so much more of a niche industry, and there's so fewer so many fewer bison. They fetch a higher price per pound um, than 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 other species. And um, so yeah, yeah. So for all those reasons, it just it was kind of always bison. We didn't really consider anything else. It just was like a yeah. it felt like a natural progression for us. Yeah, and you know, I think that I'd, I'd love for you to kind of talk about some of the aspects of uh, what bison do that that maybe cattle don't, and how they they operate very differently um, from from animals. I mean, even just in your ecosystem, but in general, because we used to have the sort of rangeland for bison was, uh, you say, mid mid Canada all the way down to Florida uh, into certain parts of Mexico um, for thousands of years. Um, and so some of the aspects that I find really interesting about them is that they would kind of create this wave as they moved, um, you know, moving seeds and and bringing fertility as, as they went. Um, you know, there, there's so many aspects of the sort of building up topsoil that is was really heavily dependent upon them. Um, you know, it's a, just such an interesting story. So I wonder if you want to kind of talk a little bit about, um, you know, what you've learned and and stuff like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, obviously it's an extraordinary story that there used to be, say, 30 to 60 million bison covering this massive area that you just outlined. And then you know, we pushed them literally to the right, to the edge of extinction. Um, and, and at one point, I mean, we, uh, we thought they were going extinct. Like in the late 1800s, the Smithsonian sent William Hornaday, a scientist to Eastern Montana to kill a couple bison. Cause at that point they said, bison are about to go extinct. We need to we need to kill a couple and bring them back to the Smithsonian so we can show future generations this animal once roamed this country. Um, so it's, yeah, it's 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 a wild story. Um, but I think you know what we've I mean one I think with bison and cattle I think they have a lot more in common than they than they than there are differences. Um, yeah. You know they're both as you said, both ruminant grazing animals, um, which I always say, and I believe this, they have these magical stomachs where they don't just survive, but they, they thrive on grass. Um, and grass is very simple. It's sunlight, water, soil, grows grass, and these animals thrive on it. Um, and so I think, you know, and I should also say that, um, you know, we we're very clear that, you know, we are a ranch. We are, this is a managed landscape. We have fences. So these are not wild bison. They don't have the ability to migrate hundreds and hundreds of miles. Um, but that, that historical context is super important because, you know, the entire, you know, particularly, you know, the Great Plains in the Western US, it co-evolved for millennia with grazing animals, most notably bison, but also elk, pronghorn, mule deer, all sorts of these animals. And um, as you know, they'd, they'd come into an area and they would have a tremendously high impact. They would graze, poop, pee, wallow, trample, uh, you know, really rough the place up, if you will. But then they, and so over a short amount of time, and then they'd leave for a long time. So it, this entire landscape and all of it, the grasses, you know, birds, creeks, rivers evolved with this, you know, short duration, high intensity impact, and then a long recovery. And so now in the world of ranching um, out here, uh, you know, with holistic management and regenerative ranching, folks are essentially trying to mimic that behavior you know biomimicry they're trying to mimic the way this landscape was historically grazed and you can do it with bison and you can do it with cattle a lot of the most progressive stuff's being done with cattle um so so here we're doing it with bison and you know i think some of the things we i've noticed is that um one the the herd instinct in bison is just unbelievably strong they they want to stay together so 
um, a friend of mine said they're they're almost like their own little you know they talk about mob grazing they're their own little right. you know mob grazing group they just they like to stay together it's all about strength and security with the herd um, and that's that's very helpful for us and and for the landscape um, they also uh, they 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 seem to prefer um, and I've heard this from a lot of different folks that raise bison they they like higher ground. And the assumption is that it's just in their DNA to want to be able to look out over the landscape and see wolves and whatever else might be out there. So um, they seem to really like to bed down in higher areas. So, you know, away from creeks, um, they walk farther to water um, there. Uh, uh, and then, as I said, you know, they, they breed on their own, they calve on their own, you know, um, they're built for this landscape. They tolerate cold. Like apparently they don't feel cold. Like it doesn't register until 40. Oh, wow. um, and, <laughs> uh, and, 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 and then they tolerate heat just fine. Um, they defend themselves, you know, that herd instinct, they defend themselves very well against carnivores. Um, so, and, oh, and then, and then from a biodiversity standpoint, they, you know, they wallow, so they, which is, they aggressively roll on the ground and create these little micro depressions, you know, on the landscape that uh, both, that help other species of both plants and animals. Um, and then they shed their coat every spring. So all this luxurious bison hair, um, you know, uh, just falls all over the landscape and all these other critters, and particularly birds, use that hair. Um, I was just reading this morning in the article you sent me, you know, that, you know, it said essentially wherever bison are, um, ground nesting birds are using their hair to line their nests and you have much higher, uh, you know, uh, nest success, chick recruitment, chick survival. Um, so there's, yeah, there's just, you know, a lot of great things that, that come with bison. Yeah, I, I, I sent that to you just because it was a it's a Sunday Times, uh, New York Times, who, who for the most part have not had anything to good good to say about meat for a very long time. Uh, but the science section, the the name of the article is establishing a new home for bison to roam. So it, it, it I always love the sort of weird synchronicities that kind of happen when you're just like you're sitting there, you're like, all right, well, meat's bad for you. But we're going to put these animals back on the landscape. But what are we? Just, we're never going to touch them. <laughs> you know, we can't eat them. Uh, you know, we could talk about all of the bi the biodiversity advantages of having animals back on the land. Um, but we have to make sure that we just don't eat meat anymore. You know, and, and it's so weird to me, like how you know, it, uh, it's an interesting conversation to have with somebody who grew up in in an urban environment. Um, you know, as yourself and myself to, I, my first job was in a butcher shop. So I didn't, you know, I worked for four years in a butcher shop. And then in my like late thirties, I, I was able to do that again uh, and work for a number of Irish butchers in London. Um, so I had a different experience than the Norman, normal suburban dweller. Um, but you kind of talk about uh, over and over again, the, the disparity that kind of happens between these sort of monoculture landscapes and cities Right, um, and then you have the the reality of of that farming environment, the ranching environment that is feeding those cities, um, and the the divide between the two is just so absolute, right? Um, you know, uh, it's just it's such an interesting thing. And from your perspective, it has to be like even more galling to kind of come at it from the urban uh, part in the first part of your life, and then now this other side. Oh um, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I find it, um, it's maddening, you know, candidly, it drives me, it, at times, it, you just want to pull your hair out, you know, you, like you said, I mean, the, the, um, and I'm an avid New York Times reader, and they seem just repeatedly to um, uh, paint with the broadest brush possible, and uh, do ultimately a tremendous disservice to science, to the planet, to their readers, by not telling the actual sto nuanced story of farming, ranching, fiber, food, and that um, it's not all made in the same way. And, and yeah, it's just, um, 
Um, and, 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 and also, I think I, one of the most maddening things for me is um, just the, 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 some of the messaging that is 100% black and white in direct conflict with, with, with itself, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and we actually, um, we, uh, we, we, it was a passion project a few years ago, but you know, I, I worked for this big environmental group and they have a, as you know, I mean, bees and butterflies are tanking. Um, they are not doing well globally. And the cause of that is loss of habitat from bad farming practices and the use of pesticides on these farms. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, you'll get an email that says, you know, eat plant-based for the environment, meatless Monday, on and on and on. And then the next day you get an email that says, you know, send us $50 to save the bees and the butterflies. And, um, and knowing that, you know, when, when that general messaging, eat plant-based for the, for, for the environment, the reality is, you know, for, for, you know, the majority of the people that are getting those emails live in urban environments. And what happens? They go into a Whole Foods, they buy a uh, Beyond Beef burger or an Impossible burger. And, 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 and they, I don't, like, I feel bad for those people because they're, they're trying to do the right thing. Yeah. Um, you know, their, their, their intentions are absolutely dead on, but, and, but they've been told that anything plant-based, it's good. It's just, you know, it's, 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 uh, nothing was injured in, in, or harmed. Um, it's wonderful for the planet. Uh, you know, unicorn dust and rainbow rainbows, you know, <laughs> emanate from the packaging. Um, and, um, and so when we both know that those, you know, those products, the foundation for those products are, you know, industrial monoculture farms that are ecological wastelands. Um, and, you know, your colleague, Diana, who's amazing, you know, um, it was, you know, says there's no such thing as a bloodless diet. And that when the, you know, when the combine goes out to harvest those crops, like whatever bunnies and rabbits and chipmunks are in the field, like they're not dodging them. So we're, we're all killing stuff. It's just a, a question of who's doing it and how they're doing it. Um, and so, so that's this, you know, so, so this plant-based messaging around, you know, that, 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 that ultimately is, is, is detrimental to the bees and, and the butterflies they're trying to save. And then we're out here on the, on our ranch, and looking at our ranch and our neighbors' ranches, and it th there are bees and butterflies everywhere in the summer. Yeah. I mean, all sorts of different colors and species and all this different stuff. And it was driving me nuts, you know? And so we made t-shirts with our uh, bison logo and, and we switched it. So inside the logo, it's uh, bumblebees and monarch butterflies. And it just says, save bees and butterflies, eat grass-fed meat. Um, and uh, so anyways, that's just one example of the you know totally conflicting information that again well-intentioned people are you know um, uh, uh, unfortunately getting this information and it yeah it just seems to only be increasing. Yeah, and I think for us, uh, like I just interviewed a guy who um, he uh, he's a Guardian reporter. Uh, he wrote a book on the insect crisis, um, and two of the two of the main points that kind of came out of that was uh, things that I hadn't known before was. Um, that we we have we have this sort of characteristic um, pollinator species, the ones that we like on posters and all those stuff. He said that um, that flies are actually a huge pollinator. Um, that you know they're they're larger body masses. They're actually more tolerant to different uh, conditions. So too hot or too cold, they're actually more tolerant to it. Um, but we we don't consider them charismatic enough to kind of put onto you know, like t-shirts or anything like that. But right. he was he was talking about how in certain countries like Finland and Germany, we've seen close to a like in Finland, I think it was up upwards of 90 90 percent of insect species are are like just gone. And we've seen that over the course of the last 30 years. Now, if you walk into a supermarket, you you know, you walk through the fresh fruits and vegetables aisles, um, you, you know, you go to your, get your almond flour or anything like that. You just see a huge percentage of all of that stuff is so heavily dependent upon wild pollinators and domesticated pollinators. And we're seeing a total war against them 
you know, in order to build the produce, right? The almond farms, the ones that we see, like we do, we just did a drone flyover for our next film. And it's just miles and miles of almond farms and pistachio farms. Um, every single one of those are so heavily dependent upon um, just, you know, taking everything out of the environment, groundwater depletion, um, which then kind of poisons the community because all of these different heavy metals that have been sitting in the water because the water levels have, have drained so much, now the water in essence becomes kind of toxic for consumption. But then you see groundwater depletion and you see pesticide exposure and you see any number of different things and you see this blank landscape and they're somehow convincing people that this is the alternative, the future that we wanna to look to. You know, and so I see a lot of these ranches and they're like, well, we don't use pesticides. <laughs> you know, we don't use any of these, these chemicals on our environment and we're producing highly nutritive food, which has taken us like, in, you know, many of the people who have kind of advocated for meat consumption for a very long time are, are still trying to convince people that meat is a health food, right? That dairy products are a health food. Um, you know, so it's, it's such an uphill climb. Um, and to Diana's credit, like she was able to kind of distill huge amounts of information and, you know, down to a 90 minute, you know, argument against this worldview. And she's continuing to do the hard work. Um, but she's equal, equally frustrated by a lot of the policymakers who will sit down with her and say that this is, this is something that's really important, uh, but we have to continue business as usual. You know, so I can I can definitely see the frustration, especially with people who are advocating for regenerative agriculture, uh, for putting back animals back on the land, you know, to producing food that actually is in harmony with the environment that tries to biomimic evolution and, you know, um, all of the all of those different things. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's I, I, so well said. And, you know, you know, for us, it's like I was just having this conversation with someone yesterday that. Um, you know, as I said, we're, you know, we have no background in agriculture whatsoever. And so we're, you know, it's not like we, um, you know, have, our family's been doing this for generations in a conventional way. And then one day we were like, Hey, what's this regenerative thing? Or maybe we could, maybe we should change for this reason or that reason. Like we came to ranching because of the environmental benefits that come with it. And, and you know, regenerative agriculture, obviously a very hot uh, term and issue right now, which is great. Um, and, and, but I would, I mean, it, it's so clear to me that within the world of regenerative agriculture, um, that uh, raising animals regeneratively for meat is the, the easiest and most efficient way to achieve regenerative goals like i think right. you know if you're if you're like example you know if you're trying to have regenerative almonds like that just to me seems very very difficult and even yeah. regenerative spinach would seem you know you're raising spinach you're at war with anything that wants to eat your spinach and then whereas like on a ranch the 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 science is 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 clear that the the more biodiverse our ranch is so the more species of grasses, wildflowers, forbs, bees, butterflies, birds, et cetera, the, the more resilient the land is, the healthier our animals are, and then the healthier their meat is, and then the healthier the people that eat their meat are. And this great scientist, Fred Provenza, does an amazing job um, writing and talking about it. Um, and so for us, you know, we ultimately, when we talk about our, when people ask us about our management practices, we manage for biodiversity, full stop. Right. And we do it, we do it for two reasons. We do it one for biodiversity because bio, you know, just we love biodiversity. We want this place to be teeming with biodiversity. And then two, we do it because that's in the best economic interest for our ranch. Right. Our ranch would be most productive, the more biodiverse it is. And then kind of going back to what we were saying earlier, whether it's a black Angus cattle or a bison, there happen to be these magical animals that have these magical stomachs that can walk around and graze the grass and thrive on it, get very big and provide hundreds of pounds of unbelievably healthy meat 
Um, and and we're obviously we're not plowing. We're sucking carbon out of the atmosphere. We're storing carbon in the soil. I mean, all these different things that come along with it. And so I just if I'm when I look at the regenerative agriculture movement or space, like regenerative ranching is again, I'll just say the easiest, most effective way to achieve regenerative goals. And um, I wish I, I you know, I, you know, I, I think that message will slowly, but it's it's getting out there slowly but surely. I mean, we see it with our customers, people who weren't aware of it and now are. Um, yeah. And but like yeah, it's a I, that's why I'm so grateful for the work that you and Diana do because it's just it's it it's going to take a while. Yeah, I mean, I do think like I, I recently went to a book a uh, book uh, publishing opening. Um, it was for Chloe Sorvino, who is a um, food and agriculture writer for Forbes. Uh, and it's primarily about, um, the book is actually really profound. I, I did a podcast with her um, uh, about a month and a half ago, but it goes into the sort of total corporate takeover of uh, food production, uh, primarily meat production. Um, so you were talking about it specifically in terms of COVID, but we knew we were creating a problem a long time ago with, with Tyson and Purdue and JBS, um, in essence, kind of taking over the whole sort of production side of, of meat um, from slaughter to, to sale. Um, and so she, she wrote a book about it. So I, I ended up going to the opening. I, there were so many people there, Matt. Huh. There were so many people. And I, awesome. they, were, they were like young, they were hip kids, <laughs> you know? Like yeah. they, they, they were not the demographic of what I thought would be sitting at a bookstore for, for a book opening on meat. Um, and they're all asking the same question. They're saying, like, how do we support the food that we eat in a way that gets uh, that makes us feel like we're we're contributing with our dollar to something that actually feels right? Um, and they they knew a lot more than I ever would have expected. Um, the only point that they had, if I can kind of digress for a moment, the only point that they had was the sort of less meat, better meat argument which I just find highly problematic because what we're seeing in New York City specifically is we have a mayor who is quote unquote vegan, he eats fish, but, and eggs and whatever else. So he's, he's you know, when, it, when he's, you know, writing his cookbooks or uh, telling other people what to do, he's telling everybody to move towards plant-based, um, but he's also taking away from kids in public schools. And so Meatless Mondays was the beginning. Vegan Fridays is his new uh, sort of push for that. Um, and so what you see is a sort of hardline uh, move to kind of take away foods from kids who are getting anywhere from 60% of their meals from the Department of Education. And that stuff can be total junk, right? Oh, yeah. Imposs Impossible Foods uh, lobbied really hard for grass status, which is generally recognized as safe foods so that they could actually start to get into DOE food. Um, and so what we see is all overall sort of switch over to, to getting uh, kids, you know, you see, you think of the downstream effects of taking away meat from children and then the educational like outcomes that'll kind of happen with that when you're not getting this highly nutritive food, it's nutrient dense food, and then you're filling it with whatever plant-based junk food is, is the new like junk food du jour, you know, whether it's meatless burgers or, you know, what a, a margarine is plant-based butter now. Yeah. Um, so like, let's kind of uh, go back a little bit. So you, you, um, you started, uh, you found this plot of land. Um, had you had access to, uh, to getting an initial herd? Like what was your herd size? Um, and like, where are you now in terms of that? And then like, where, you know, like, give me some kind of like, you know, origin story of like the first day when you closed your fences and you had like, you know, you know, animals on the land. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, you know, I, I, I'll start slightly earlier because, because, um, and I think, you know, we talked about this before, before we um, started recording about like, you know, younger, you know, like people in their twenties and thirties that are interested in say, leaving the city and trying their hand at farming or ranching or something. And as first generation ranchers, like we're, we're very passionate about both, you know, sh sharing our story and, and helping others. 
Um, and so for me, you know, I, I'd had other, you know, different entrepreneurial ideas and, and some, they were either bad ideas or I chickened out and I, and so through the, the bison ranch process, like I knew that there were, um, that we weren't going to have every single detail ironed out ahead of time, but I, right. but I knew not, I, but it, like, like fencing, for example, it's like, I, I knew that there are other bison ranches that exist and they had figured out fencing and, and I could talk to them and that there were, you know, we could, we could find bison there. We could acquire bison. Um, you know, so, some of those like nuts and bolts piece of it, pieces of it. I, I kind of saved those for later. And it was the bigger like business plan, lifestyle, all those things that were like, I felt are, were the, and the gut check piece were the most important part of it. Um, and then, and then we found this land and, and this was, literally the only land we looked at in person we kept looking online but nothing else came mm. close in location price like it 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 was this or nothing and we got it under contract with as long a closing date as possible and then we really went into what i call you know sponge mode where we just tried to absorb as much as possible right. and we were very lucky um in the sense that the folks in the bison ranching community in montana were incredibly welcoming and incredibly generous with their time. And um, we got to tour some, a couple ranches and, and I got to develop a couple mentors along the way. And, and each time it just kept demystifying it. And it was like, okay, I, I think, um, you know, we can, we can do this, we can do this. It just kept like, um, you know, it was interesting. We, I always, I, st I always had this insecurity of like, if you didn't grow up ranching, you can't be a rancher. And even when it was under contract, I was like, man, I just feel like every, a lot of this is falling into the, like these pieces are falling into the right places. But I, mm -hmm. I would say, Sarah, I'm like, I just, I'm, I'm, there must be something someone's not telling us. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I was waiting for someone to be like, did they tell you about, you know, X, Y, Z? And I'm like, ah, that was it. <laughs> That's why we right. can't do this, and uh, but they never did, and we just kept, you know, we said we'll we'll just keep putting one foot in front of the other until someone tells us to stop. Um, anyways, but yeah, we got the we we ultimately got the land under contract, got through closing, worked with this great guy uh, uh, on fencing where he had to pull out um, miles. Was it, old. Yeah, was it a ranch before? It. it um, it, it, at one point it was, okay. uh, and then, um, and then it was, uh, it was owned by a few out of state real estate developers, um, who ultimately, uh, I think at, at one point thought about, you know, developing it and doing something with it. And then just and ended up, one of them died. There was a state attorney involved and they decided they just wanted to get rid yeah. of it. Um, and neighbors were grazing it seasonally with their cattle. Um, uh, but that, that, so, so that, that was the, the, that, that's how things were here. And, um, but for bison, you know, we had to forest is the person we worked with and he had to, you know, tear out miles of barbed wire fencing, put in new fencing and, and we use, um, high tinsel, uh, uh, wildlife friendly fencing, the middle wires hot or electrified. Um, and it's, it's great. We, we really like yeah. it. Um, and um so anyway so fencing in the fall um and then we uh had to find our bison and the advice was you know there's certain areas where you could save a little money and certain areas we needed to spend a little money and yeah getting your animals was an area to spend money you know you wanted to make sure that you were starting with great animals and and also importantly animals nearby you know animals that had you know uh over i guess modern times are used to your climate landscape plants etc so like if we found a deal on bison that were in say missouri like that'd be a horrible idea like we wanted to get yeah. animals that were used to life in montana and so um there are these two great ranches like 150 miles northwest of here along the rocky mountain front and um we uh we that's ultimately where the bison came from and um yeah so the day they arrived it was um you know needless to say very stressful uh 
extremely exciting, but, but, but very yeah. stressful. And, um, you know, people were our, you know, people in the community had heard about it and were interested to, you know, watch kind of, kind of, how is this all going to work out with these Skoglin people that are going to try to raise bison out here? Um, and I always, it's like, it, it turned out, you know, it was, it was pretty controversial, um, which I, mm. I knew a little bit at the time, but not as much as I know now. And, um, and, and I, and I, and I totally get it. Like, we're surrounded by multi-generation cattle ranches. Um, and our neighbors are first and foremost, wonderful people and incredible, incredible ranches, ranchers have been doing this, you know, a hell of a lot longer than we have for generations. And if you put yourself in their shoes, you know, you've got multi-generation cattle ranches. And then you hear this young family from Bozeman, who's really from Chicago, are showing up with no ranching experience. And they're going to run bison. Um, like, how could you not be a little nervous? And like, how's this going to work? Um, but to their credit, like, you know, they were open-minded and they gave us a chance, and uh, have now become good friends and trusted, you know, colleagues. And um, so, uh, so yeah. So when the bison showed up, there was definitely a little excitement in in the valley about it happening. And uh, yeah, watching them run off the truck onto the land that we'd been, you know dreaming of and then working our asses off of, you know, getting all this ready. It was an extraordinary feeling, you know, like it was, it was yeah. incredible to watch them um, uh, run off the truck onto the land. And it was like, and it just, it was like, all right, they're here. This is real time to get to work. Um, and so, yeah, it was, a, it was a really great day. Yeah. Um, so how many did you start out with and what are you at now? So we, we started out, with um we so we we started out with 95 um yeah. with an asterisk which is when we were getting this going um we uh we had a hard time getting financing um and and we we ultimately got it done but the bank was they said we're clear like we'll give you the land loan but you cannot come back to us for anything like a line right. of credit operating capital like we need to see that you know what you're doing you have a viable business and so along the way i met this guy in big sky really nice guy who was interested in getting getting into the bison industry and i joke kind of joke but not joke all of a sudden we had a lot of land and no money and he had a lot of money and no land and um mm. so we talked about doing a custom grazing lease and it was a way for us to grow the herd a little faster and so um, we ended up putting a three-year custom grazing lease together, where of that of those nine of those ninety-five animals that came from those two ranches, thirty were his, sixty-five were ours. It was all run as one herd. I was in charge, and then he also gave us um, a loan so we could buy our own animals. Uh, you know, buy those the sixty animals that, that we had coming. So. We start, that's now over and he found his own yeah. ranch somewhere else in Montana. I just saw him, he's doing great. Um, so anyways, so started with 95, they weren't all our, our, all our animals. Um, and, but now we're up to somewhere around 170, 175 animals of all ages. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's pr pretty good size herd. That's amazing. And, and you, you were saying on another podcast that you, um, uh, you'll age them for two years or do you go, do you try to go by some, some degree of like a, a visual interpretation of weight? Like yeah. I, I was trying to get a sense of that. Um, Good question. So we do, we do, a, we do a couple of things. So, um, yeah. uh, so for, for the animals born here on the ranch, any bull born on the ranch is a meat animal and we weigh, until um with with rare exceptions we wait until they're at least two uh so we we long story short bulls born in the ranch we kill between two and three um okay. and between the ages of two and three and you know just it bison develop a little more slowly and yeah. obviously you know we're a grass-based operation and um the butcher meat processor we work with are we you know they're complete meat geeks just like I am we spend a lot of time talking about meat meat quality taste flavor etc 
And so, um, you know, one, I guess, mentor said, you know, taste comes in at two, like you want to wait till at least two. Um, and then even within that, you know, between two and three, we're de definitely looking at, all right, that, that one there, that bowl there, clearly bigger and more developed than the one there. So we're going to kill that one. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and then, and then um, each year we've got such a good relationship with those two ranches. They, they're breeding operations. So they don't do what we do. They, they raise animals, they raise breeding stock. And so when they work their animals once a year, any open cows, non-bred cows, they sell as cull animals. Um, so they're perfect meat animals for us. So each year we supplement our herd with some open cow meat animals from them. And those are usually now, we, like I'd say um, for our prime meat animals, they're like for the open cows, they're like two and a half to six. And then we'll do some older open cows uh, purely as ground bison. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have to work our animals once a year. And then same thing, when we work our animals, any, 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 any open cow here immediately becomes a meat animal. Um, so to sum up, our meat herd is fed by bulls born in the ranch that are killed between two and three, and then open cows here on the ranch between, um, you know, say three to six, and then some open cows from these two other ranches that we bring in in the winter. Um, and that, Again, with a few other exceptions, that's that's that that compromises, you know, or comprises 90, 95% of our meat herd. Mm. There's a guy in Spain who um, uh, slaughters his cows at 14 years. He said yeah. the taste is like off the charts. <laughs> well, I, I wonder what it would taste like. I actually really so, do wonder. You know, yeah. it's so interesting that you say that because, um, um, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, uh, I, I love to hunt. I'm a big meat hunter. And in yeah. the hunting world, you know, there's all these like kind of urban myths or farm hunting myths, if you will, about like, well, you never want to eat this animal because it's not going to taste good. And this animal always mm. tastes good. But so much of it's not backed up by science, like in any way, shape or form. And I, and I feel like it's the same in the livestock world because I've heard that about like in yeah. Europe. And, it's, and I know it's now happening in the U.S. where like some high-end restaurants are experimenting with much older animals because the flavor is just off the charts. It's so, yeah. it's so much more pronounced. And we've done a couple experiments. We, um, we, we had a, uh, like this school group, they're like of college kids that through this program where they bought a bison and they were going to process it themselves and we sold it to him and I, and it was an, it was like 10 or 11. And I gave, I said, here, our price is X amount of dollars, but I'd also like to keep a chunk of backstrap and a chunk of tenderloin. Cause I'm just curious, like, what is this? Let's just say it was 11. What is this yeah. 11, -year -old, you know? And we cooked up those steaks and same thing. They were like, just unbelievably delicious. Um, so I think, you know, from, uh, yeah, I think the livestock, livestock slash food industry, there's a lot more that could be done with older animals. Um, uh, so yeah, no, I, I've heard the same thing. Yeah, uh, when you when you hunt, uh, how how long do you hang your animals uh, before you process them? I'd say um, w one to two weeks. Um, okay. So I, I listened to a. Uh, there was a, a meat eater podcast, the Steve Brunelis yeah. podcast, and they had a meat scientist, I believe he was from the University of Nebraska, and they broke, like, really breaking down the details of, of meat, and most of his research, I think, was with cattle, but, you know, there's a lot of similarities, and his, uh, as I recall, his thing was that you want to age any, any, you know, um, grazing animal, uh, like like whether it's a deer, an elk, a bison, a black Angus cattle, um, at least a week. That over the course yeah. of that week, the um, you know the the enzymes in the meat and the it's 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 tenderizing the meat. And um, you know you you kill an animal, twenty four hours it goes into rigor mortis where it's stiff as a board. 
And then it slowly, slowly, slowly is, is being tenderized and loosened. And he was saying that I think like the majority of the magic happens over the first week. And then, you know, over time, it just kind of falls off from there. So it, we kind of average, yeah, for animals, I, you know, hunting animals, one to two weeks is about what I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's definitely really interesting. I, I had was there was a restaurant I think in uh, it's a Scandinavian restaurant called Fabrican Fabrican. Yeah, yeah, Fabrican. Yeah, yeah, he was talking. Didn't he have like some sort of sixth age month, uh, uh, six month aged uh, meat on his plate at one point? He's, he's sort of a nut. He lost. His yeah, no, I, 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 no, I, I. <laughs> I have his book. I've seen him on TV. I yeah. like he's yeah. I love his whole. He's crazy in a great in the best way. Yep. Um, and yeah, he was like I think same thing. I think he was. I think they were killing some like old dairy cows and doing oh like, yeah wild yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the the butcher shop that we went to when we were in Belgium. Uh, he's sort of a superstar. We were when we were in the airport. There's like huge thirty foot poster of him uh, just in the airport alone uh deer and dog um but he he has this really wonderful uh uh it's one of the best butcher shops i've ever walked into uh just the sheer variety he uses all of the animal in in myriad different ways uh but he also has like a two michelin star restaurant uh attached to it and so we 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 got to uh to taste a uh dairy cow who uh I actually don't remember how old it was, but it, it, the marbling was so, it was so beautiful and so tasty, um, just in comparison to even just most of the, uh, the uh, any of the other steaks that we tried. Um, the marbling was just completely different. Um, just so like throughout all of the muscle tissue, it had all of this really wonderful, like uh, yellowish, like whitish marble. Huh. Absolutely delicious, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I've, I've experienced it you know the first bison i killed long story short was a, a friend as an got an employee harvest tag at this at, and um it was a, a, a much younger animal and uh um and and we processed it ourselves and and, and um and then and then we killed our first bison here on the ranch which is kind of a funny story because you know we we did, you know, all this work. We started the ranch and all, you know, all the stuff we've already talked about. And then, but and but we we did not feel comfortable selling our meat until we'd gone through the entire process ourselves. Um, yeah. you know, we want to be able to stand behind our product and know exactly, you know. So we want. So we the first animal we called it the R and D animal. We I field harvested a bison and you know we got eventually got it back. And um, I was like, hey, let's just cook, you know, let's take a ribeye and cook it like you would any old ribeye. And, you know, we're all excited and we throw it on the grill and, you know, I'm having a beer and then I put it on the cutting board. And all of a sudden I had this like panic attack of like, oh my God. I'm like, what if it doesn't taste good? Like, <laughs> you know, it's like we did all this stuff, all this due diligence. Yeah. Like, at no point could we have said, hey, can we put a bison on this property for a year and then kill it and eat it and see what it tastes like? And I was like, what if like our combination of grasses and water and all this stuff, it just doesn't taste good. It's like, you know, yeah. um, and uh, anyways, we cut into it and it was like, my eyes rolled back. It was so good. And it was like, yeah. we were really excited. And then it was interesting though, because a few months later I stumbled upon a couple steaks from that younger animal and we cooked it. And in the hunting world, like without doubt, it's the conventional wisdom is like a younger animal is more tender, it's delicious. And that younger animal was so inferior in quality to our older and to the older animal that we were eating. Like it was, it was a lighter red in color, and it just was like kind of flavorless, where the older animal was like deep, rich, red, intense flavor. Um, so I just think, yeah, I just think there's a lot of misinformation out there around this kind of like younger animals are taste better. Older animals don't taste good. Like clearly that's not the case. Oh, totally. Like yeah. anything, there's lots of nuance, right? Like yeah. it all comes down to like, what did that animal eat? How did it live? 
how is it killed? How is it aged? How, you know, all those from the from you know all those different things translate through the to 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 the steak on your plate. Um, so, anyways, yeah. Yeah, I was looking at your website, um, and you know, a lot of your steaks, man, it's like they're, they're purple on the inside. There's so much color in there. And uh, I recently picked up a, a book. It was something I was listening to. Um, and it's a, do you know David Montgomery? He wrote a book called uh, the, it's called, I think it's called Dirt, the Erosion of Civilization. Huh. Um, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a really, he's a geologist. He's, he's written for a long time. on a, uh, um, it, it's, it's a seminal book. It's like you, you read that book and then you just, you kind of realize like how much topsoil we've degraded or lost um, over the past, you know, whatever, since, you know, the dawn of agriculture. Um, but he, 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 his argument is that, uh, you know, civilization is based upon the soil uh, and nothing else matters except for that. And it seems to be the sort of the thing that we think about least, um, especially within the civilization itself. Um, and it's an exhaustive study. He goes through Roman, um, the sort of Egyptian bread baskets. Uh, when you think of Egypt now, you don't think of necessarily like, you know, a, a, a great agricultural landscape, um, but, you know, but for the most part, that was, that that's what fed the Roman empire. And you see, uh, you know, in the Ukraine, we see what happened there, that all of these, uh, and the sort of Midwest as these sort of agricultural landscapes built on soil um, and the soil vampire in many different ways. Um, but he recently came out with a book, him and his wife, uh, she's a biologist, he's a geologist, and they're talking about the degradation of our food because our soil is so depleted nowadays. Um, yeah. And they were just talking about iron content and you know any number of different um, you know vital uh, nutrients, not just macronutrients that are are depleted because we're essentially feeding our animals on uh, and and our plants and vegetables on nothing anymore, uh, the absolute minimum to make them look like they're supposed to be. Um, so that was what I was thinking about when I was looking at the cutting into your steak was like. Oh my God, like how much iron is in this thing? <laughs> you know, yeah. how much nutrition is part of this? It's like, I wouldn't have to eat for a week. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, no, I, I've read similar things that like don't have the like hard data, but that like, a, like your average carrot in the grocery store today compared to say a hundred years ago, like you'd have to eat, yeah. you know, 14 carrots today to, a, to, a, to get the same nutritional benefits from like one carrot. You, um, you know, I mean, it's depleted soil, chemical farming. It's not, you know, doesn't lead to uh, healthy, nutritional, uh, nor nor delicious products. Yeah. And it, it's so weird because I think, you know, for the first time, you and I are probably about the same age, but, the, you know, we have seen uh, the growth of such a, um, uh, a spotlight on food over the past like 20 years. Like I think even before the year 2000, you wouldn't have heard about farming and agriculture in the way that you hear about it now. Like people are looking into this stuff. Even if you go into the absolute extremes of like LA where people are, you know, heavily focused on detox foods or juicing or any number of different things, people are highly focused on that, um, on, on clean eating, I guess is what they're calling it. Um, but what we're what we're seeing, it, I I think, is what we're seeing is these foods that mimic uh, the outside textures of uh, of what food would have tasted like a hundred years ago, but they have none of the deep nutrition of that. Um, you know, and we are learning more about the sort of the dark matter of nutrition, right? The the stuff that we don't know that we don't know. Uh, we know that we measured certain things because we could measure them. Uh, and now we're starting to find out that most of that stuff actually works synergistically. Um, and so you can't just take all of these in, you know, constituent ingredients, put them into a supplement and then feed your body with those supplements. Um, and so we're seeing this symbiotic relationship between the food that we're eating that has nothing left in it and the soil that has nothing left in it uh, and this sort of total extraction atmosphere. Um, and I think that's what regenerative agriculture is trying to sort of battle against saying, we have to start to think of this holistically. Like when you go to the doctor's office, you shouldn't really be talking to the doctor. You should be talking to the farmer type of situation. Right. You know? Oh, I, 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 I oh my God, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, 
like strongly. And I, um, I'm sure you have no shortage of potential podcast guests, but this guy, Fred, Fred Provenza, who's a retired professor from Utah State, now lives in Montana. He wrote this book, Nourishment, and he, which I haven't finished, but he, uh, he, he's been to the ranch and just an incredible guy. And you guys, you'd have a total mind meld on, on that exact subject. And he's, and, and, and he, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. I just, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I do think that there's, um, in order to sort of, uh, put pressure on the level to which people are kind of talking about this need to move over to plant-based, um, we, we need as many people from disparate fields to kind of talk about this stuff. Um, because the, the, what Diana calls, um, carbon tunnel vision, like, oh. you know, the methane from cattle, methane from cattle, methane from cattle, like that is all that we hear. And it's just, it's such a, just a, does such a disservice to what these animals do. Um, eco, like e total ecosystem engineers, and we've reduced them down to one basic component that we're just hammer home to people. Um, and it's just, a, it's so like disconcerting and it fucking pisses me off. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm curious. I love that because I trust me, I, as I said multiple times, I mean, you know, our family, you know, we, we just love nature. We, you know, yeah. like, yes, yeah, was it yesterday? Yesterday or the other day, I saw an ermine run by, which are these, these cool little, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, like a long tailed weasel. And in the winter, they're all white with a little black tail. And it just like, yeah. I, I ended up, I, I spent, let's just say, I spent way too much time staring at the window that day, um, <laughs> uh, trying to see it again. And then that yeah. night, I'm like, Sarah and the kids came home. I was like, you're not going to believe what I saw today. I was like, I saw an ermine. They're like, what? Um, so we just love biodiversity. Whenever we see a new bird species or, you know, any kind of big critter on the ranch, we get so excited. And and so I, 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 uh, I couldn't agree more about the carbon tunnel vision. And it's something that I bring up a lot because there's just such a focus on carbon, carbon credits, carbon markets, paying ranchers for carbon offsets and carbon in the soil, carbon tests, carbon, 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 carbon. And exactly, it's like, well, what about, you know, as I look out at our ranch and our neighbor's ranches and these places are teeming with life, bursting with biodiversity and there's just, yeah, there's not enough emphasis on the all of the biodiversity benefits that come with regenerative ranching yeah and you know one of the uh, I, I don't want to keep you too long and no, no, I, I'm, I love it it's great. Yeah. um one of the things that i found when when you create markets like this that actually don't bring people into uh like a, a holistic concept of you know a, a building biodiversity or building something um that that matters to future generations um sort of like you know what is the the term it's a planting a seed uh for of a tree the shade of which you'll never uh sit under so you're building something that like future generations will do will have the shade of one of the things about the carbon markets is that they they tried to institute an afforestation process in mexico and so they took all of these um uh uh you know poor communities and they said listen like uh, we want you to, uh, we're going to pay you to go and plant these trees. Uh, and so what the community did, which kind of makes sense, like in retrospect, and I think anybody who actually thought about it holistically would have been like, yeah, that's ridiculous. What they did was they chopped down a bunch of trees uh, and sold the wood and then uh, planted, um, you know, seeds in the places where they just chopped down the trees. <laughs> and it like, it, I mean, it's it's sad and it's kind of a joke, but it's like when, when people are living in poverty, just giving them say, hey, we're going to do this and we're going to force you to to plant something. It's like you can't think about this stuff in, in the way that we're thinking about carbon markets, um, yeah. you know. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, I it, totally. And it's like if you if you really play it out, you know, these carbon markets, like a lot of it, I mean, so, so are, you know, some of these bigger companies you know, they want to buy carbon offsets so they can say yeah. in a legitimate way that, that our, our supply chain is carbon neutral. And, you know, I, they all have their own reasons, whether it's, you know, because they want to, because they care about climate change or it's marketing or some combination thereof. Um, but that, you know, there's, there's definitely, there, there's that part of it. And there's just so much emphasis on carbon 
that I, I always think of, um, and he was just in the paper, the longtime lead wolf biologist in Yellowstone National Park is this guy, Doug, mm. Doug Smith, amazing guy. And um, in a documentary that we did at NRDC, he, he was in it and at the, he, it, he ends it with this, like he does this amazing job where he says something to the effect of, he's like, he's like, at the end of the day, like what kind of world do we want to live in? And he's like, is, is it all for us to just take or do we want to share it? And I think about that, his quote a lot, because I'm like, what kind of world do we want to live in? Like, what if we event, invent like carbon sucking machines? Like, if it's all about carbon, are we okay with a world that we, where we suck, we have these carbon sucking machines, we produce food in factories that taste like crap, and, but has some sort of nutrient profile. The bees are gone, the butterflies are gone, lots of birds are gone, lots of wildlife are gone, but carbon's down. And it's like, that to me, if, you know, there'd be a win on carbon, but it'd be a loss on every yeah. other piece of the world. And ultimately, like Doug talks about and others talk about, it's like, what makes this place magical? And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, uh, the carbon piece um, strikes a nerve with me, you know, particularly being out here you know, working on the land, being on a ranch and, 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 you know, constantly being inspired uh, and touched by the landscape, the birds, the bees, um, the, 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 you know, it's just, um, um, it's just an important piece of it that, that doesn't, as we talked about, doesn't get enough focus. Yeah. And that's a good segue for me. Like, so how did your kids acclimate to the changes? You um, know, it's, it's funny. They, they, they yeah. Great. Um, and the, and it's uh, one of the reasons, you know, so as I said, I had, I had had other, you know, entrepreneurial ideas that were either bad or I chickened out on. And after we had our daughter, Greta, um, she was born in February of 2017. And we knew we weren't going to have any more kids. And, and it really, this com particularly a conversation with a friend about, you know, at some, at some point, you know, you, you only have to, you can't keep pushing this off forever. Like if you, yeah. you aged out um, and it lit a fire under my ass where I was like, you know what? Like right, ki our kids right now are like less than one. And I guess in the auto was four. And so we were like, this is a huge change for us. And, um, and it ended up, that was, th that spurred us to do it now because I joke, kind of joke, not joke, like if we did this when they were in like eighth grade and sophomore year in high school, they'd be like, hey, mom and dad, like, good luck with your bison ranch. Yeah, like, I'll see, I'll see yeah, you later. That, that sounds fun, but like worst day in here and uh, you, you guys go have fun out there. So right. it was almost like we had to do it when they were so young that they, um, so, so now, um, you know, our, uh, they love it. And our, you know, our nine-year-old's obviously older, so he's a little more aware of things, but it's been cool over the past year. Um, to, he's starting to really get it. And I think, and, and then the coolest part, like by far, is just seeing 100% what, um, just what they're absorbing through osmosis, just growing up like this. Like I hear them when we're driving, pointing out things, talking about things. And like, there are words in their vocabulary around nature and ranching and food and the environment that like 100% were not in my vocabulary before the age of 30. Um, yeah. And they're just like, um, you know, so that that's, and, and, and Sarah and I, we've made a conscious decision. Like we don't, um, we don't shield them from any part of the ranch. Like they are, they, they're like, they see a dead bison, you know, they see blood on the, in the driveway. Like they're, they're they, they know exactly what we do, how we do it, why we do it. Um, and, um, and, and particularly with the nine-year-old I've seen, he's, he's developing like pride in it. Like he, he's proud that we do what we do. And um, so, yeah, from, a, from, from, from their standpoint, it's been really cool to see. Yeah, I was um, uh, over the holidays. I was uh, I was making a porchetta, which is a pork roast uh, surrounded by pork belly, uh, and so uh, breaking it down. Um, and my nine year old, uh, she just took a mallet to it. She was trying to tenderize the meat, 
Um, but she had noticed that there were still hair follicles on the belly uh, and there was a nipple. And so it immediately kind of connected with her. She was like, oh, you know, like this will kind of happen every once in a while. Um, Cause I'll, I'll get from local ranches, I'll get a pig's head every once in a while. Um, I'll boil it down. Um, I make a lot of sort of jellies from it and stuff like that. Kids won't go anywhere near it at this point, but it's so important that they see that this was an animal uh, oh. and that this is providing nourishment for us. And they get those sort of like moments, they get the small moments over the course of their life. Um, because I do think that there is there is something weird about city life. Um, you're, you're in Chicago, I was in New York. There is some sort of like strange phenomenon where people genuinely think that they're they're not dependent upon the death that kind of occurs outside of the landscape of that the zoo that they kind of live in. Um, and they can live forever or, you know, you can kind of convince them of any number of different things. Like New York is, is primarily finance and advertising. And so it's a lot of people kind of, you know, sort of making up shit, <laughs> right? And so when you think about it, it's like, to get her to see elements of that, to see, you know, to death around her and all of that stuff. It's just such an important ingredient to their development um, because it, it, you know, it, it's required, you know, it's required for us to eat. Um, and I think the narrative going into the sort of 21st century, the way that we thought about what food would look like would be this sort of, you know, plant, plant-based, meaning like factories, right? Like when people say plant-based to me, that doesn't mean nature anymore. It means aluminum and, you know, like antibiotic, you know, like washes and, you know, sterile environments and lab coats and all of this stuff. And it, 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 it brings me absolutely no joy. Um, you know, I mean, it's oh, just like, it's such a, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Right? When you, yeah, to, to me, I, I, same. When I hear plant-based, same thing, I think, Factory, like, and I, I think about it all the time. It's obviously, I'm, you know, we're both passionate about it. But like, I'll see, like last winter, I saw um, on our ranch, we uh, there was a herd of uh, over a hundred pronghorn antelope, and um, wow. all bedded down in the snow. It was just so beautiful. And I remember, and whenever I see something like that, I'll often just involuntarily think to myself, like, I wonder what the pronghorn habitat inside the Impossible Burger factories. Like. Um, <laughs> You know, it's just like, but it's like, yeah. it's a joke, but it's also like, not, you know, it's like, yeah. um, you care about pronghorn antelope, like, they need a lot, like, we, they, they need big landscapes, if that, you know, to survive and, and do what they need to do to, to survive, you know, and have a big enough population and blah, blah, blah. And in Montana, like, that's a combination of public land and private ranches that provide that. Yeah, and that's you know part of the reason why we've been so heavily focused on this the sort of thirty by thirty movement, thirty uh, percent of the earth kind of being uh, like made into these nature preserves, um, because it, it it really considers business as usual, right? So everything else can continue. We can just continue to, you know, pollute waterways or do any number of different things to build some sort of like vision of civilization, and then we're just going to have these. Um, like geodesic domes of wildlife that will continue to survive. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with George Monbiot. Uh, he's a, a British um, sort of thought leader, guardian writer. Um, I've, I've, animal. Definitely, I've definitely seen his name around. Yeah. And it, it, the biggest problem that I have with that is that like you can't hold this stuff off right from the, from the rest of the environment, right? Like you can't build some sort of ecosystem uh, that that won't have outside inputs. And so if the air is polluted or if there's acidification going on or any number of different things, we have to we have to build an environment we want our children to live in, which which requires you know us to redevelop in some ways civilization so that we actually we value that. And I love what you said about, you know we we became bison ranchers because we were environmentalists. Because you will see on those placards, every single time you see an environmental protest, you you can't be a meat eater and be an environmentalist. And like, <laughs> well, I, no, I mean, no, I mean, it, it drives right? me nuts. Because like, like, and same thing with hunting. Like, you know, the like, you know, so the most passionate environmentalists I know, yes, are hunters. You know, like, yeah. like they are so connected to the land and animals. And you know, if there was some bad development project somewhere in elk habitat like 
hunters are going to be the first ones there opposing it. And, yeah. um, and then, you know, and similarly kind of back to our kids, like for urban listeners, I wonder if, you know, people are probably like, oh, what? like if these kids are growing up around like dead bison and blood and all this stuff, like, are they going to be, are they like, you know, sociopaths? And it's like, what I'm fine. It's like the opposite. Like yeah. our, our kids are um, so connected. I, I guess what I'm seeing is that like, they care so much about the natural world and they care so much about animals. They're very aware. Like we eat, you know, bison, elk, deer multiple times a week. Like they, and then they know where we're eating. They, they, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but they like with all the development in Bozeman, our son, like continue, like he constantly will say like, Oh my God, there they go again, destroying more nature. You know, like they're, they're just keyed in on a different level by being closer to the natural world. And, and yeah, it's just, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's just an interesting, there's just a, yeah, a lot of confusion um, around these things. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, and, and the thing about it is, and, and one of the things that worries me most is that the average age for most farmers in the States is, is over yeah. 50, you know, like we, we have to build an ecosystem environment so that kids can grow up in a place where they could take over those, those jobs that, you know, there's so many farmers who can't pass on the land to their children because it's not a, they can't afford the income from two separate households. Um, we have to do something better, you know. Totally. What we're no, doing. we have. To, yep. No, we've got to find a way to, um, yeah, to 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 ch change the system to put more money in farmers and ranchers' pockets to make farming and ranching um, uh, more viable long term. For the exact, you know, we yeah, I think about it all the time that you know what's going to happen is all these. Yeah, it's a huge question. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe we do a reverse a Chicago slaughterhouse where all of the Chicagoans move out and start up their own bison ranches. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it like, you know, get it, we somehow get this sort of urban, like rural divide to sort of have a, a real conversation, you know? I, mean, um, I think, no, and I think, I mean, one of the things that, you know, living out here and getting to know our neighbors, the incredible people that it's like, um, it's important that like, you know, on that point, like farmers and ranchers, they're already here. Um, yeah. So it's, it's not um, getting people from cities out here. It's putting systems in place that make it work for the people that are already here and have been here for generations stewarding this land. But, you know, due to the farm bill, and the big four meat packers and the different systems that are coming out of Washington, DC are unfair and not helping the current farmers and ranchers. So to me, it's not, you know, bringing people from Chicago out here. It's let's fix the system for the people that are already here and have been working their asses off for generations. Let, let's fix the system for those folks first. Um, you know, like that, 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 yeah, that, that, yeah. Yeah, I mean John John Maynard Keynes, who was a, a economist at the beginning of the 20, 20, 20th century, um, he he has an old quote. It said something like, "You know, societies can afford to pay for what they want to pay for." Um, and you know, for me, that that's like a guide star for me, like a North Pole. It's like would if we want to build an environment that is conducive to human health that values human health um, and values the environment around them, then we need to build up a, a farming structure um, that isn't so extractive, that builds, you know, all of these di different key factors. And then you pay for it, you know, you pay for it in a way that actually makes it work. Um, you know, and I think that that is what Diane has been working on, you know, is, is getting a, a collective together um, to, to, really talk about regenerative agriculture in a way before it gets co-opted by say Kellogg's or something like that. Yeah. 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 Um, but thank you so much. Uh, uh, how will people reach out to you? Uh, give me your contact details and all of that stuff. And, uh, and we'll get this up as soon as possible. Sure. You know, the, so the easiest thing is just our website, um, northbridgerbison.com. And that has, uh, an email address and a phone number on there. Um, and then 
the only social social media we do is Instagram and it's just um, North Bridger Bison. So yeah, North Bridger Bison on Instagram and our website, northbridgerbison.com. Um, and, uh, you know, folks should feel free to reach out with questions or anything. Um, cool. But yeah, no, James, I, I can't thank you enough. This has been awesome. I could, I could, I could keep going for two more hours with you. So yeah, um, totally. uh, yeah, but do, no, you st- do you still have that guest house? Cause I might come up there. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, that's a, we ultimately moved into it. So when we, ah, got it. Yeah. So when we started it, we, we commuted, we, we commuted back and forth from Bozeman, operated it as an Airbnb, and then ultimately moved into it a year and a half ago. And so that's where we now live. Um, and we, we sold our house in Bozeman and put a little, put a, put an addition on it. Um, uh, but yeah, no, if you're ever out in the Bozeman area, obviously, you know, let me know. Cool. Awesome. And yeah. keep up the awesome work. I, I, I so appreciate, um, you know, I, I, uh, what you and Diana do and, um, I learn a lot from it. So thank you. Cool. Cool. All right. Let me just stop the recording. Um, Thanks so much for listening to the Sustainable Dish podcast. If you like the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you'd like to support the work I'm doing on Patreon, please visit sustainabledish.com backslash join. As a Patreon subscriber, you'll get access to ad-free podcasts, plus exclusive video podcasts, never-before-seen interviews, and a discussion community. Go to sustainabledish.com backslash join, and thank you for your support. 